Vsauce, Kevin here with a slot car racetrack to visualize how fast I can safely drive without getting pulled over. What's my maximum speed without wreaking havoc on the justice system? And how can we use game theory to find the answer? Here we go. Oop. Oop. All right. That didn't really work out very well. Honestly, I don't even have enough room to properly set up this track on this table, so um, I'm gonna need some help. Luckily, I partnered with Curiosity Stream, and I know just the guy. Hey, Sean, as host of the awesome new Curiosity Stream show, Speed, I was hoping that you could help me visualize speeding, but looks like you already have yeah, well, the track here. Kevin, to do just that, I have magically manifested exactly the same track that you have uh, right here on my super table. Super convenient. Yeah. Boom, okay, okay. so. Let's race. I will be the cop car, and you will be the civilian driver. I wouldn't have it any other way. Okay, do I get a head start? Yes. I'm gonna pull you over. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so I'm racing ahead. Yeah. There's a turbo button, which you can use kind of in the straightaway. That's okay. helping me gain on you, actually. Yeah. But uh... if you turbo in the corner, it's too much speed and you fly right off. Why right? did that happen though? Okay, that happens because in this case, you overseeded the coefficient of friction between the tires and the slot and the, the top of the track. Now these cars, they can go around the corner a lot faster than a normal car can because they have this little peg that's riding in that slot. Yeah. So when they go around the corner, they're resisting centripetal force, which wants to sling it off. The car wants to keep going in a straight line. Right. But this slot helps drag it around the corner. Now in our cars, we don't have a slot, so if we go around a corner too fast, we slide off when we exceed the coefficient of friction of our tires. And our tires, although they look kind of big, they really don't have that much space on the road. And I'm right. gonna show you that. I brought one of the tires off one of my motorbikes here. I'm just gonna sharpie the top here. Now this looks like a pretty big around tire, right? Rides down the road, only when it's riding down the road on the street, it's really only got about one inch. Wow. Right, if we take a look at that there, there's really only about one inch wide and maybe three inches long. That's the contact between me and the motorcycle on the ground. The same is true on the tires on your car, right? The tire is all the way around, but the only part actually touching the ground is that little bit on the bottom. And if you have your tires overinflated, you're getting a much smaller contact patch. That makes the sense. Tire's not deforming, right? Yeah, yeah. So that little bit, the contact patch, is important to understand. You've got four of these little contact patches there, maybe four inches by five inches wide on your four tires, and the weight of that car pushing down on that contact patch is the only thing that keeps you from sliding off the road when you go around the corner. The weight of the car, the inertia of the car, wants it to go keep going straight. When you turn the car, the front wheels move off in one direction, and the friction makes those tires track around the corner. The reason that's important is because you're also using that same friction not only to go around a corner, but you're using it to accelerate and to brake. If you accelerate too fast, you overcome the coefficient of friction between your tires and the ground with that little contact patch, and you do a burnout, mm -hmm. which can actually be a lot of fun in a controlled environment. <laughs> but the more important thing for all of us driving around that's yeah. really, really pertinent to our safety is that the faster you go, you're asking more and more of that little tiny contact patch to help slow you down when you hit the brakes. So if you're going way faster, you have to be easier on the brakes. If you lock up the brakes, you'll slide the whole car forward. And that's what's happening here. Is you just have it carrying too much speed into the turn, tires and the slot can't take it, and you're sliding right off the track. Okay. You wanna try it again? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, where's the cop car? Let's restore the. Go ahead. Okay, here we go. So that's a technical reason why you don't wanna speed. But there's lots of other reasons why you don't wanna speed too, right? Yeah, I mean, you, that's why it's dangerous to speed, but also in society, you know, we have to have, oh, there we go. In society, we can't have that happening. No, we time. can't have that happening. You know, we want everyone to be safe and we have rules and regulations and law enforcement in place to make sure that everyone is acting safely. The thing we don't really think about is that driving in a system governed by law enforcement is actually a two-player game and both the driver and the police officer are playing this game. Let's say that the speed limit is 65 miles per hour. What's the fastest that you've ever driven? Because I have a feeling it's a lot more than that. I've driven about 130 miles an hour. Okay. Yeah. But my question is, what is a sensible speed to drive on the highway? The answer to that question is somewhat complicated because it really depends on the highway and the conditions and if it's raining and the state of your car, mm -hmm. right? 
but in general, for, for roads that are, we collectively deem we need to go slower in because either it's near a neighborhood or because the road itself is twistier, we have lower speed limits, right? Yeah. And we have big straight super highways where we can all do 75 or whatever the limit is in your, in your area. But, but the, the, the point is that cops can't pull over every single driver just for going one mile per hour over whatever that limit is because not only is that logistically impossible, but that level of law enforcement would probably make everyone pretty angry. So when we drive and the police monitor us, we're playing a game of recursion to get the best result. Both of the police and the drivers are sort of playing this game from different sides. Exactly, exactly. We've got a couple of basic rules in this game. We have a legal speed limit of, let's say, 65 miles per hour, and we have common sense rules that tell us that we can only go so fast before it gets dangerous and we're flying off the edge of the road. And the police officer has a threshold at which he or she will ticket the driver. So each player is deciding what to do based on what they think the other player will do. Yeah, there's a gray area, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, it basically works like this. As the cop, I'm thinking, how fast does Sean think that he can go without getting pulled over? Right, and as the driver, I'm thinking, how fast can I get away with right. without getting pulled over? Exactly, exactly. And as the cop, I'm also thinking, how fast does Sean think I think he thinks he can go? And he's thinking, how fast do I think he thinks he can go, and that's recursion. At the end of this process, which can be infinite, both the driver and the cop decide their best courses of action. For the driver, that's like you said, how fast he can go safely without getting a ticket, and for the cop, that's how fast he'll let the driver go before pulling him over. Right, and this whole game takes place in that gray area. I mean, I know if I stay under 65, I'll never get pulled over. That's the easy way to do it, right? And I know if I go 130, I'm gonna get pulled over. <laughs> so there's this strip there. And that's the gray area where that, that game you're talking about is getting played. Ultimately, so what do you think would be an exact value if the limit was 65 miles per hour that we could get? Like, you could drive without getting pulled over and so that you're happy with the speed that you're going. I think it's general wisdom that you can get away with about five miles over the speed limit, especially on the highway when there's no chance of, of coming across a stop sign or someone on the road, right? So when there's, in a safe environment like that, I think everybody pretty much feels like they can go five miles over the speed limit and not get pulled over or somewhere in that gray area. Both the police and the speeder are playing this game from their own sides, right? The speeder trying to figure out how fast they can get away with, the police trying to figure out how much they'll allow, but they both have an incentive to make the whole system work. So when they both play the game and they find this place where they get to speed a little and don't get pulled over, they're, it's in that gray area they find a balance, and that balance is called a Nash Equilibrium. What Sean described is the best reply to another player's best action. And when neither player has an incentive to deviate from their decision, they've reached a Nash Equilibrium. Okay, I need to talk more about Nash Equilibrium, but I need my whiteboard table. So thank you so much, Sean, for all of your help. Make sure that you watch his show Speed on Curiosity Stream. I know that you guys will love it, but for now, I have to, I have to, I have to go. Okay, now one of the most famous Nash Equilibrium scenarios comes in the form of the well-known prisoner's dilemma. The scene is simple. Two people get arrested for a crime. They're separated and can't communicate with each other. The police can convict both on a lesser charge, but they need more proof to convict them on the big one. That means one has to testify that the other did the crime. So is it in each prisoner's best interest to rat on the other one or to stay quiet? Here's how it plays out. If both prisoners A and B rat on each other, they'll each get two years in prison. If A blames B, but B stays quiet, A goes free and B gets three years in prison and vice versa. If both A and B stay quiet, they'll each get one year in prison. The rational prisoner rats because that's the only way he's going to go free. And when he rats, it always gives him a better result than if he doesn't rat, regardless of what the other prisoner does. That's called a dominant strategy and the Nash equilibrium in the prisoner's dilemma is achieved by betrayal.
But if the other prisoner also behaves rationally, he would rat as well, and they'd both get two years. The best course of action here is cooperation, where both stay quiet, serve a lesser sentence, and have the least bad outcome. In the prisoner's dilemma, not betraying the other guy goes against the Nash equilibrium, but it gives the best possible result for both players combined. Because if one rats and the other doesn't, three years are served, and if they both rat, four years are served. Through cooperation, only two years are served. Political scientist Robert Axelrod asked 14 game theory experts to submit computer simulations of the prisoner's dilemma. The ones that advocated more self-interest by betrayal were noted as not nice players, while the ones that focused on cooperation, they were nice. After running them all, the top half of the performers were all nice models, while the bottom half were all not nice. So it pays to be nice, as long as the other player thinks it pays to be nice, too. We play these two-player games all day long, not just with the police. When we give a gift, we're playing a game. For example, say you've just met someone and you kind of like them. Giving them a spatula is probably not a great gift. Giving them a diamond ring on the second date is probably a bit much. Pump the brakes there, Billy. In the gift-giving game, you want to send the right message based on what you feel and the recursive process that happens with what you think they'll feel. You want to feel good about the gift you gave, and they want to feel good about the gift they received. And whether you're driving down the highway or trying to impress your crush, you're almost always in some kind of two-player game. And Sometimes you're in several at once. The best way to play is to be smart, to pay attention, and keep your best interest in mind. But you'll usually win the most when you make sure to be nice. I guess Grandma was right. And as always, thanks for watching. Hey, gigantic thanks to Sean Riley for opening up his shop to me. Go check out his brand new show, Speed. It's a four-part docu-series where Sean blasts through humanity's need for speed on land, wow, on sea, through the skies, and into space. CuriosityStream and I worked out a deal for you so that you can sign up and get 30 days completely Free. Just click the link below and go to curiositystream.com slash Vsauce2 and enter the promo code Vsauce2, all lowercase. CuriosityStream gives you unlimited access to over 2,400 brain-feeding documentaries starting at just $2.99 per month. But for you, you can watch Sean's show free by using the promo code Vsauce2. So you should do that. The show is awesome, honestly. You'll like it. Go watch it. Go watch it now. Okay. Now.